Here we are with Michael Murphy, founding principal of Mass Design Group. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us. Yeah. We're here as part of the 2019 School of Architecture uh, lecture series at the University of Texas at Austin. For more information on the school, events, future lectures, and how to apply, visit soa.utexas.edu. Michael, thanks for taking the time to sit with us. Thank you. So I want to start here. Your firm, uh, Mass Design Group, based out of Boston, it's, it's really focused on social and political consequences of the built environment. So I feel like that's, uh, in school, there's this really, there's this big focus on that. But when you go to most firms, that seems to go out the window and it's mostly focused on fee and type of project and all of this sort of thing. So why has that been so instrumental in your firm? And uh, why does it, how have you been able to maintain the success you've had in this industry? I think for the purposes of the social and political implications of the built environment, you know, I, I don't think they can be extracted from architectural decisions. Uh, one might argue that any architectural decision has social and political implications. I think one of the challenges is that when we do get pulled into the, the market-driven um, process of, of both responding to and making architecture, a lot of those uh, decisions that we fight for as designers uh, get separated from our control. So I think architects become architects to make a positive impact on society, on their communities, not just for their own um, protection or the monuments of their own uh, genius. Uh, the problem is one of the issues is in the marketplace, we um, have to jettison some of those ambitions in order to meet the requirements of the project description or the RFP uh, where our agency is extracted from from the discipline. So I think one of the things that we're trying to do is, is to re-empower the discipline as well as re-empower the practice model so that we can uh, not have the luxury to jettison those social and political ambitions as well as goals that we may have as designers uh, and, and actually embed it within the project itself. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of firms that are relatively, I would say relatively small firms, four or five person firms that are really focused and doing great work in this field. What do you think specifically your firm was doing that allowed you to scale in the way that you did? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, certainly students, a lot of young practitioners that also are focused on the implications of their design decisions on the built world. And, you know, this isn't a new thing either. I mean, the history of architecture has always had practices or, you know, academics or young practitioners who emerge attempting to uh, influence uh, the built environment for the betterment of society. Uh, the challenge has always been how do they continue with that as a practice model and how do they work within structures which inherently are about hoarding power instead of distributing power. So uh, our firm, I think, you know, from the outset had asked a question, uh, is it enough to be a size where we can only influence certain small specific projects, which we have great respect for those firms that do that. We asked if we could also do that at a scale of the, the kind of national project or compete with other, let's say, standard for-profit practices uh, with the model of a nonprofit. And that question at the outset, I think, has driven us to try to look for larger scale projects, more institutional sized projects, uh, in order to make the argument that as a nonprofit, we still can compete within the marketplace. We just have different um, structures in place that allow us to, um, or, or force us into a more accountable position with the social and political implications that we have, might have with the project we're designing. So before we get too far in your career, because there's a lot to talk about, and I know you yeah, don't have much time, but real quickly, take our audience through just where you grew up, kind of what your parents did, the economics of the household, and end up all the things you could have done in life. Why the heck architecture? Uh, so I grew up in a small, kind of smaller sized city uh, on the outskirts of, um, on the far outskirts of New York City called Poughkeepsie, New York. Poughkeepsie um, is one of these river cities that was once a thriving uh, mid-sized city that saw incredible economic decline, uh, disinvestment, uh, redlining, racial polarization, uh, and real crisis uh, through, from the mid-century to today. And uh, we grew up there. My father was in local government. He worked as a uh, Department of Public Works and then worked for the county as a civic employee. And my mother uh, 
was a nurse in the local hospital. So they always had um, a commitment to civic engagement as, as people. And I think grew us up with a, a sense that you're like, required to participate in the public discussion and the public domain. So that was always something very proud that I, my father had. I think it's really interesting that you're probably about the 40th interview I've done. And I think people's parents' economic situation or values seems to really manifest itself in the type of architect that emerges, I guess. I find it very interesting. But you studied, you got your, you got your undergrad in English literature. Yeah. And then that shift not only to architecture, it's two dramatically different things, but architecture school at the GSD, the top school in the country. Can you take us through that experience, what it was like in coming in without a background, trying to compete with the, some of the top, top architecture students in the world? Uh, how did you manage that whole situation? I was very unprepared, to say the least. <laughs> uh, I think we all were. I don't think you're alone. So. <laughs> well, there were these amazing students that you know, came from especially BRC programs that really knew how to put, you know, designs together. And I mean, I came into the GSD not knowing what a, you know, really what a section or, you know, really the difference between a section and a plan per se. I mean, I think that first semester is this incredible level setting experience for so many students to learn a new language and a new methodology, but also try to shoehorn their own experiences within this new uh, set of standards and set of uh, working habits as well as value systems and uh, and language, a whole new uh, methodology and a whole new language uh, that comes from architecture that you know, I think is new to anyone that isn't in that from before. So, I mean, I came from English literature, which I studied in at the University of Chicago um, and was really looking at, you know, the University of Chicago's most modern book is probably Ulysses, you know. So we were looking at, uh, you know, Renaissance poetry. I was reading John Donne and um, William Crashaw and others, Richard Crashaw, excuse me, and others. But I, I think, you know, from that experience, um, I, I wondered where the relevance of my studies before could, could be applied to the conditions of today, especially in a kind of political condition. And when I had the... Um, you know, privileged to study in South Africa with some amazing anthropologists from the University of Chicago. They really showed how the changes in the government that time, uh, the end of apartheid, this is like 2001, was manifesting itself in the built environment very rapidly. And it occurred to me that the decisions that were being made in the political domain were manifesting really clearly in the architectural world and the built environment. And I, I saw there a very clear connection between both the effects of power as well as the design decisions on power. And um, I think the seed was planted there that there was something, some, something deeper in the political um, domain uh, through the built environment. Uh, so I got interested in architecture there. And when I came, I had a kind of personal crisis where my father was very sick with cancer and moved home from South Africa to live back in my hometown, which again was not a thriving location and uh, in that scenario, um, found myself working kind of intimately on the reconstruction of my old home that they had bought uh, as a kind of beat up project. And um, that experience working really intimately with a family member on, um, on the construction and protection of our own home, of our own house, also gave me another lens through, where, through which buildings influence our, our lives every single day. So both from a macro level at the political spectrum in the community, like the end of apartheid and how that shaped uh, the city of Cape Town, uh, to the very intimate emotional and spiritual connection that working on the, the restoration of a home can have for our, uh, our sense of purpose, I think gave me um, a kind of a commitment to say that architecture not only has political and social dimensions, it has spiritual um, uh, ontological um, effects on our life and um, and the ability to work in that field uh, became a kind of a necessity for me and so that's when I applied to school and, and started the GSD. So starting your firm can you take us through those early days of mass where um, kind of what were the first type of projects you were working on and you're pretty young to have the success or amount of success you've had. You hear in school like, oh, Luke Hahn didn't de design his first building until he was like 107 or whatever it is. But so my question is, can you take us to those early days? Was there ever a time when 
maybe that phone wasn't ringing and how did you manage to get through that time period and what was that moment when you really thought like man this is going to work well i'm still wondering if it's going to work uh <laughs> but i i think that you know the early days were, were maybe a slightly different than i don't know it's hard to say i don't know what it would be like to start another firm but we didn't set out to start a firm we set out to work on a project for this amazing doctor and nonprofit. Um, uh, the doctor's name is Paul Farmer, the nonprofit is called Partners in Health, and they were working directly for the Ministry of Health of the government of Rwanda, among other governments, but Rwanda was the place where they were investing a lot of resources. And when I met him, he talked about all the work that they were doing, and, um, and I asked him who the architects he was working with, assuming then that we could link the School of Architecture with the School of Public Health. And he said, you know, honestly, very few architects have reached out and said, say and ask how they can be helpful. And we're just figuring out ways to do it with our own resources by ourselves. And he said, I challenge you to figure out a way to connect these pieces together. And I thought that was a really amazing and surprising prompt. And here was someone that in the world of social justice and activism is a legend. And yet in our school, we were really still focused on um, this kind of, object-driven architecture. There was the sense that the, the pursuit of design and architecture was itself enough. Um, I think Dr. Farmer gave a sense of purpose to, to what an architectural project might be. So I started working with his organization and when he came back in my second year of school and said, would you help us with this next hospital project we're working on? I then turned around to my colleagues in the trays and the school, my friends, and said, would any of you help? Do any of you know how to do this? Would you want to do something like this? And that's really what began the project, which was um, how do we work for this incredible organization to think about a new medical facility, which has very limited resources, but in a very rural area, but would serve a vast amount of people who are underserved. And I think in the process of trying to answer that question, and doing whatever it took as a service, um, we built in our own minds an understanding of what practice needed to do to answer some of these, let's say, last mile questions. So I wouldn't even say mass as an entity really existed until we finished that first project. And the question, the second part of your question is, well then, how did you continue? And at that point we had to, to survive, we had to hire people, we had to raise money, we had to bring in contributions. We had to be a nonprofit in order to accept those donations. Uh, we had to figure out a way to kind of build the ship as we were sailing it a little bit. And the outcome after the completion of that first project was that we have this entity that is in existence with staff. And I was still in school. You know, I was like finishing my first, my degree. And we had a staff and an office. And, <laughs> and uh, so to some degree, I, you know, graduated with you know, a job already. Um, but there was a sense that like we had to continue because the projects were continuing. And I found out then that I think instead of waiting for the call, we just said yes to like everything, everything that was relevant and mission aligned. We said, yeah, we'll figure out a way to do it. And that's what built those early days. Well, talking about, I think it's really impressive that Mass. I mean, there's not a lot of architecture firms that you can go on and look at this, the team that they're working with and see such a diverse group of people. You have a great representation, I think, numbers-wise of women. Uh, six of your 14 uh, partners or board members are women, which there's not a lot of firms, I think, that take this approach. So can you say just uh, what, was, what is the benefit to the firm of having all these different perspectives on a project? And... Um, why are more firms not following the lead of mass? No, I, I mean, certainly in terms of different perspectives and positions and experiences. I mean, at the outset, I mean, that is, a, is the essential component and ingredient. You know, we know very little. I mean, we came into the architectural world with very little, if no expertise at all, um, and relied on the experiences and expertise of others to be able to ask hard questions and, and you know, seek answers we didn't know we had to look for. Um, we also early on are very resistant to 
I think we're challenging the question of the single auteur architect, that the architect alone is the genius that makes decisions. And um, his, typically his, <laughs> Uh, opinion is one that would, you know, be the last stop on any decision about a building, and it very much reinforces the notion that architecture is very object-driven and very uh, form form for form's sake driven. Instead of what we all know is true, which is that architecture is made by the opinions of many, and the, it's like more like an orchestra instead of you know a singular auteur. This. Um, collection of different expertise that come together and make all these incredible compromises to make a building. So, you know, from the beginning, we thought of ourselves more as a collective, as a, as a group of folks who were making decisions together and not, um, uh, not relying on a single decision maker. So that, I think, at the beginning is how we structure our organization, and that's how we continue today. Um, but it, it, is, it does require specific investments and uh, and expectations to say we want the kind of a diversity of perspectives as well as other people involved in making those decisions and to take whatever power that we find ourselves adjacent to and try to distribute that internally. And I think we've taken it very seriously from the beginning, but certainly um, as that discussion has emerged more and more in the profession, which I'm very pleased with, to be able to to represent our own values that. that we want to make ourselves irrelevant as a as a leadership board and be distributing um, those decisions into an entire team of people, spinning out practices that represent these values as well as replicate and improve upon the tests that we're making. And our hope is not just to make um, an organization which is both diverse and um, multivariate in, per in perception and perspective. Um, but is actually to create a movement where many other practices emerge with ways to empower themselves to create decisions in the built environment. So I think one thing that I would always ask of, when we talk about, um, I'll say, rattling off the check boxes within um, the inequity of our profession, one thing I, I think we encountered early on, which I think is worth pushing within the profession, is it takes a really long time for an architect to become an architect. You graduate school, you go work for a firm, you do your hours, you get licensed, you maybe moonlight and do a competition, then you start a practice. And by the time you're starting your practice, and this is the case with many of, the, many of my friends who are now starting their practice, we're 40 years old, you're starting a family, um, and you're having to take an enormous pay cut in order to test out this idea of your own practice. It's a very, very difficult um, financial burden to absorb and not, no surprise, uh, people who have less financial capability, who have fewer connections, who are making decisions between their family and their work, uh, leave the profession altogether and have to take other jobs by necessity. And this of course re reproduces a very male dominated, wealthy dominated um, profession. And I think doesn't create those kinds of pathways for people to practice. So I think one other thing that we're interested in trying to push for is speed to practice. How do we shrink the time between graduation and practice or even school and learning and practice? How do we expedite that process? Because if people start practicing quicker with less burden financially, then you know, the 10 year mark will be hit and they'll have a thriving practice and they'll start to represent the world in which we live in instead of the world in which, you know, the inequitable world and in which reinforces those power structures around us. Well, I'm interested to see how Matt takes it. And uh, Michael Murphy, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think people will too. And uh, thanks a lot. Really thank appreciate it. Thank you very it. much for your questions. Yeah. Take care, everybody.